Well, hey, go ahead and turn in your copy of the scriptures to Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to continue on in our series called Your Kingdom Come, and the message tonight is called Speaking from the Heart. All right, so you've probably heard uh, somebody get up in a situation like this before and just say, hey, you know what, or maybe it was at a a graduation or at a funeral or somewhere like that, and they would get up and they would say something like, you know, guys, I just want to speak from the heart. You ever heard anybody say that before? Yeah, I think we've all all heard somebody say that. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that most of the time, <clears throat> all of us are speaking from the heart. That's what Jesus tells us in the passage that we're going to read today, is that we are speaking from the heart, and sometimes we don't even like to admit that. The things that come out of our mouths are actually not just an uh-uh, or not just an oops, or not just a, well, I was in a bad mood, but that that's actually the thing that was actually inside of you to begin with, and it just took it just took something in life bumping into you a little bit to make that thing slip out of your lips and then land there for other people to see, perhaps. And so, or you might do that when you no one else is around, and the real thing that's in your heart, boom, comes out a little bit easier. And then maybe you're more of a professional Christian, so when you're around other folks, maybe you don't say those same things or do those same things because you know it just wouldn't be nice right so we can remember on palm sunday the original when our lord and savior rode into town on the donkey on a colt and people were yelling hosanna hosanna uh that wasn't really what they what they were saying didn't actually line up with their actions just a few days later because they wound up shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And it didn't take very long for that change to happen inside of them and that change to happen in their words. And so we certainly need to be a people that are taking a look at the things that we are saying and the actions that we are doing because it's an actual indicator of what is going on inside of us. And so let's pray, ask the Lord to bless our time together, and then we'll jump in. So Lord, thank you so much for Jesus, for the day that he rode into Jerusalem with his face set toward the cross and his determination to make a way for us to be able to have salvation in him. Lord, for him to be able to set us free from the bondage of sin and to be able to have a chance, Lord, to live a life that's pleasing to you. God, I pray that you would help us as your people to be a people who have good fruit in our lives and God, that that would come from the inside, and Lord, that it would be displayed on the outside, and we pray this in Christ's name, amen. So tonight we're going to be going over Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37, but uh, before we pick up there, let me just remind you what's happened in verses 22 through 32, and that's this, is that, well, really in all of Matthew chapter 12, Jesus has had this run-in with the Pharisees. And they have a dispute over what's allowable to do on the Sabbath. And so Jesus pushed back on their man-made traditions. And he said, hey, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, right? I I made the Sabbath, so I think I get to decide what's allowable to do on the Sabbath. And, of course, he's right. Um, And so they didn't like that. And they left there that day going away. Um, The Bible tells us they left there that day going away. And it says in verse 14, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. And so they already had it in their heart and in their mind that they weren't going to see this guy any other way. He had to be destroyed because he was coming up against them and their traditions. And so we pick up um, just a few verses later in verse 22, and there's a demon-possessed man or a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute. And he came to Jesus, and Jesus healed him. And so the crowds that were around there began to ask this question, can this be the son of David? Like, could this be the Messiah, the prophesied one? That's the son of David. It's just another way of saying the promised Messiah. And so they began to ask this question, and of course that infuriated the Pharisees because they had already predetermined how they were going to view Jesus. They didn't like how he was approaching the Sabbath. They didn't like how he stood up to them. And now to have other people begin to realize who he really was infuriated them. And so they lobbed this thing out of their mouth saying, 
No, he's not the son of David. He's not the Messiah. Instead, who he is is that he's a guy who's casting out demons by Beelzebul. He's casting out demons by the prince of demons. And so they were trying to make a case to the people that Jesus was only getting rid of these demons because he himself was demonic. And, of course, that's a pretty big, bold statement for anybody to make against God. And so they were calling him out like that, and he has a few choice words to say to them. Of course, he just uses logic at first to say, well, would it really make any sense for Satan to cast out Satan because a kingdom divided against itself can't stand? That doesn't make sense. Sure, maybe in one instance um, he might have conspired to do something like that, but this is something that Jesus was doing time and time and time again, was going around healing people, casting out demons, and doing good. And his actions did not line up with the actions of evil. And so Jesus goes on to tell them that basically what they're doing is they are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit and that they need to be really careful because the words that they're saying could make it so that they would actually become unforgivable. Like they have allowed their hearts to become so hard that salvation is not going to come to them. And so that's where we pick up, and Jesus continues right along on this same thread or this same line of thinking in verse 33. So the message tonight is called Speaking from the Heart. And we're really going to hit just three things here. We're going to see an illustration about a tree, about a treasure, and then how our words are a testimony to us or against us, right? So we got a tree, a treasure, and a testimony. So let's pick up reading in verse 33. It says this, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. So Jesus gives this illustration basically saying that, you know, if the roots of a tree are bad, then the fruit that comes out of it is going to be bad. And the same is true. He was trying to make an illustration not about gardening, right? But he's trying to give us an illustration to say that if the root in your life, that is your heart, is bad, then what comes out of you is going to be bad. And so he's putting this on these Pharisees saying that it's not surprising that the fruit that you're displaying is bad because deep down your heart has not been changed or transformed, but it's actually bad fruit that's coming out. It's like the heart is the root and the words are the fruit. So your words are like, um, like just a gauge of what's actually going on inside of you. And so he gives this illustration of this tree, and the same can be said for you and I in that the fruit in our lives is on display. What happens a lot of times, though, is that this fruit comes out in our lives, and we might even notice this fruit. Anybody have any fruit in your life that maybe you're not proud of, maybe like a a bad attitude here, or a slip up in a word there, or holding on to a grudge over here. Anybody, anybody perfect like Tim, or no? <laughs> um, yes, but what we like to do sometimes with this fruit is we like to pick it, look at it, and go, well, yeah, I see what this is. But, and we try to justify it, right? Well, the thing is, is this fruit's bruised and beaten and rotten because of so-and-so. Like, they did this, they caused this. Now the, now, the reverse is true. You could go over as a tree inspector to somebody else's tree, right? And you could notice fruit in their lives. And what we tend to do as humans is we tend to inspect other people's fruit. What we tend to do is judge other people's actions or attitudes harshly and then give ourselves a pass, like make excuses for rotten fruit in our lives and then continue to allow it to be produced. But then in other people, we notice that and we don't cut them a break. Am I right? That, that's true a lot of times. And so that's why Jesus has given us this illustration and nailing it right back to this heart issue. Same thing in this next illustration about a treasure. Let's read this, verse 34. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? Rhetorical question. You, you can't. You can't speak actual good. You might be able to pretend like you're speaking good, 
But the truth of the matter is, is that people will eventually be able to see through that because your talk is poisonous like a, like a viper. For out of the abundance of the heart, and this is kind of a central verse here in this passage, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. So in this illustration, Jesus is likening our hearts to a treasure chest. And he's saying that there in that treasure chest, we have stored up things. And if we have stored up things that are good, things that are holy, things that are right, then when the time comes for that chest to be opened, then what comes out of that are good things. But if evil things are stored up in there, then when that's open, that Pandora's box is open, then evil is going to come out. It's just a matter of fact. It's just um, the truth, the reality of this world and how we're wired is that that is the way that it is. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is it that we are putting into ourselves, into our minds and into our lives, uh, in front of our eyes? What things are we storing up into our hearts that are now a part of this treasure chest called our heart? Another way of saying that is, what are the things that we actually treasure? What are some of the things in this world that people treasure? I'm going to ask you this. So just throw out some answers. Not you as good, godly Christians. Of course, this won't count to you. But what I'm saying is your coworkers, um, people in your neighborhood, what are some of the things that people in this world are known to treasure or to store up? Their appearance. Their appearance, yes. Calling me out. I was thinking about myself. Oh, okay. We got the same. Power. Power, things. yes. Things, belongings. Belongings. What'd you say back there, Liz? Greed. Greed, yes. Okay. Yeah. Emotion. Emotion? Promotion. Oh, promotion, yeah. Yeah. Moving up that ladder. Hmm. Yeah, we like to pull those out of the treasure chest once in a while and look at them, right? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we like to hold on to those grudges or those wounds for way too long, and it gives us some kind of uh, pleasure or maybe even a power over someone else to say, you wounded me, and maybe on the outside I've said I've forgiven you, but then I'm really actually deep down holding on to this. And that person's moved on, but it's still affecting us because it's still in there. Um, yeah. Sorry if I added too much onto what you said, but anybody else? Yeah, all kinds of things that folks treasure in this world. And so it's no accident that when something comes up in your life that triggers um, that chest to be opened up and that treasure to be displayed that what comes out could sometimes surprise even you yourself, right? To go, ooh, where did that come from? Any, everybody ever say that before? Like, I don't know where that just came from. I don't know what came over me. Well, it's not what came over you. It's what came out of you, right? Uh, it's what was in there in the first place. An illustration that we used this morning at our MC was that if I'm walking across the room with a cup of grape juice and I trip, stub my toe, and spill, what goes out onto the floor? Grape juice. It's a simple question, right? It's a silly, silly illustration. If you're carrying grape juice, you don't spill milk or water, or coffee. You spill what's in your cup. And so we may sometimes make the excuse that I was in a bad situation or that person did this to me and that's why I reacted that way or maybe overreacted that way. That's why I said those things. That's why I'm, I feel justified in holding a grudge. That's why I might not have said anything publicly, but in private, man, I really gave the, them a piece of my mind. Um, whatever that may be, the truth of the matter is, is that the things that you and I say, and a lot of times the way that we say them, actually says more about us 
than it does about the person or thing that we're talking about. I think that's worth me saying one more time. What we say and how we say it a lot of times says more about us than it says about the person or thing or situation that we're talking about. So let that sink in this week and examine your heart because we know that in this world, we're always going to run across all kinds of situations that can trigger us and that can make us want to make an excuse for our actions or our words. But Jesus says that um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It can only say what's already in there. So he gives the illustration of this tree and of this treasure. And then third of all, we come to this testimony. And this is a pretty big deal because these two illustrations are leading up to this final consequence, something that's pretty weighty. He says this in 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So Jesus is telling us that on the day of judgment, that great day when we stand before the Lord, that people will give an account for every word that they've ever spoken. I don't know about you, but that, that's pretty concerning, right, to me to go, man, every word, because they say that every single day as human beings, we say enough words to fill a book of about 50 or 60 pages. So if you think about it, we've got some pretty big libraries that are filled up with all the words that we've ever said. And so what we're really given an account for there, of course, is not the actual words themselves, but the condition of our hearts. Because when he says this, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. It's not the actual words that count. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus has also said, and you'll remember this, that Jesus has said in another place, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into my kingdom, right? So you can be saying, Lord, Lord, and saying all the right things, but you're not going to enter into his kingdom because it's not the actual words. It's the heart condition. What he's saying with this little phrase is this, is that your, your words tell on you. So but when he says that for, by your words you'll be justified, if your heart condition is right, you've been transformed by God, given a new heart, and been born again, then your words will justify you because um, they will overall speak about who you are, that you've been redeemed and set free and brought into God's family, and that you've been a person that's been actually following Jesus and being transformed by him, being sanctified by him, and have words that actually match up to who you say you are. Now, does that mean that you'll never falter in what you say? Well, the book of James tells us, well, I don't think that's possible because then you'd be perfect, right? If you kept your tongue in check all the time. However, you and I as believers, when we do slip up and when we do mess up, and you will sometimes do that, we don't just give ourselves a pass, but the Holy Spirit actually brings conviction into us, into our lives, so that when we had that blow up or when we had that gossip session or when we had that blame session or whatever it is for you that's coming out of you, um, the Holy Spirit will convict you about that, and you'll go, you know what? I need to go back and apologize and make that right because I can't hold on to that thing. I've got to be able to let it go. And then when he says, for by your words, you will also be condemned, he's saying this, is that if you've lived a life that is untransformed, then if you have a heart that's never been changed by God, then your words will um, show that as well. And so your actions tell on you and they show who you really are so that's what's going on in these situations is that um, Jesus has given these illustrations about the tree and about the treasure what we really value in this life I'm reminded of the um, parable or the story about the rich young ruler when we're talking about treasure because Jesus 
he comes to Jesus and says, hey, I've kept the law. What else can I do to, to have eternal life? And Jesus says, well, go sell everything you have and then come follow me. And the guy looked at his treasure and then he looked at Jesus and realized when it comes down to it, what I value most in this world is not Jesus, it's my stuff. And so that was his treasure and he didn't actually follow him. So that spoke a volume of testimonies against him and he did not enter into the kingdom of God. Let's go back to the beginning of this story a few verses earlier when we read about the demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute and was brought to him, and Jesus healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And then the people begin to ask this question, could this be the son of David? You see, the, the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus came, I think this is a pretty interesting thought, is that Jesus came to die on a tree, as you and I know. Jesus came as the greatest treasure in the universe, the Son of God, and should be our greatest treasure. And then when he changes us from the inside out, we actually then have a testimony to be able to share about what God has done inside of us. What happened to this man who was oppressed by a demon and was blind and couldn't speak? I have to imagine, this is me filling in the blanks here a little bit, give me a little bit of liberty, all right? This, I have to imagine that this man who was touched by Jesus and had his eyes opened and had his mouth open to be able to speak would have been one who could have said, I see Jesus for who he really is, and now what are my lips naturally going to speak? They're going to tell the story, right? about how this guy, Jesus, showed up in my life and changed everything about me. He healed me. He changed me. He saved me. He rescued me. And then there's other folks on the outside who seemingly had good sight and the ability to speak really well, the Pharisees, and yet in a spiritual sense, they were blind, and the things that they were saying were completely untrue and dark. And so as we sit here today, we have to make sure that we meditate on these things and remember that our Savior, yes, he rode into town on Palm Sunday, but ultimately he didn't come to just ride into town. He came into town to die on a tree. And because of that, what we treasure in life should ultimately be changed. We shouldn't value what other people think about us, we shouldn't be as injured when other people speak ill against us. Um, we shouldn't be as upset in this world. We shouldn't hold on to grudges or greed or uh, our treasures or whatever it might be because Jesus has become our greatest treasure. We shouldn't be able to make excuses for ourselves when we blurt things out, but what we should do is say, God, would you show me what I'm valuing and what I'm treasuring and why the words that I'm saying or maybe the attitude that I'm giving out is not really honoring to you, why I'm blowing up on people, why I am dismissing people, why I am talking about people behind their backs, why am I doing those things? That's not honoring to the Lord. And if you, as a believer, you'll do that, then you can meet with the Lord, find rest in Him, and He'll come alongside of you and change you from the inside out. He'll change the root system, right? He won't just tape on some fake fruit in your life, which is sometimes what we like to do as religious people, to look good on the outside. But instead, what we all want and really need is this change to happen at the root level so that it comes out of us naturally, that good will come out, um, out of us. And then we'll have a testimony to be able to share. And in fact, what will actually happen is that our lives will actually be a testimony, right? So if you want to be a good testimony for the Lord and you want to have um, what the New Testament says, speech that is savory, speech that is flavored with salt, right, that, that's actually valuable and that, um, that's helpful to other people, the way to do that is not to primarily just practice some nice Christianese phrases so that in front of other people, we can come across like more righteous than we really are. 
really the way to do that is to go away with Jesus and to let him just change you from the inside out. It's not an easy answer. It's not a three-step answer that you can just put into practice right this second. But it is the ultimate answer to say, I need Jesus to change the ecosystem of my heart. And when he does that, what naturally will come out of me will be good. And what will naturally change is my attitudes and my actions. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thanks so much for the opportunity, God, to be able to open up your word, Lord, and hear the things that you have to say, not to just these folks in this crowd or to these Pharisees, but, Lord, also to us as your people today. God, I pray that we would be a people who would not give ourselves an easy pass, um, that we wouldn't just try to justify our actions so that we can continue being the same old people that we've always been. But God, I pray that we would desire more, Lord, that you would give us a desire and the power by your Holy Spirit to be able to be the kind of people that you're calling us to be. God, I pray that we wouldn't be satisfied with just getting along, but Lord, that we would seek to be transformed. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just plateau in our Christian lives, but God, that you would do a work that's noticeable by other people, not so that we can be noticed, but so that you can. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.